And in this episode, we are going to cover capacitors and take a look at what a capacitor is and its construction. Also look at how it stores energy in an electric field. And then look at some characteristics of the capacitor as well. So let's go ahead and take a look. So this is a drawing of a capacitor and the schematic symbols that we use uh, come in one of two flavors, either just the double straight bar or one bar and a curved side. <clears throat> so now we're starting to talk about components that are polarized just like diodes are, right? So diodes have an anode and a cathode, capacitors have a positive and a negative. So uh, sometimes this, this bent bar or this curve here is used to indicate the negative terminal of the capacitor if it's an electrolytic capacitor and we'll talk about the different types shortly so anyway that's the schematic symbol we use uh, when we do our analysis so there's two things uh, that can happen in the internals of a capacitor right so essentially all it is is nothing more than two plates separated by some type of an insulator okay so just two conductors separated by an insulator. Now that insulator could be air. The insulator could be some other dielectric, um, you know, ceramic, uh, mica, something like that. So the insulating material is called the dielectric, right? And so uh, you could also just put a piece of paper in between here. So uh, there's been, there's experiments that first year circuit students can do where if you wanted to make your own, you could use a paper clip and then just put two pieces of uh, small metal and then separate it by a uh, just a single piece of paper and you've created a capacitor okay so there is an actual break technically in the circuit okay so this is what happens when we charge a capacitor so the capacitor stores its energy in an electric field okay and so that means that you know there's a potential here from one side of the capacitor to the other, just like you would find with a battery. Uh, a good example of that in real life is when it's cloudy outside, especially if there are thunderstorms brewing. All of the negative, all of the electrons gather on the bottom side of the cloud, and the earth is very much um, positive, positively charged. So um, you have this potential that exists, and what happens if the uh, energy gets strong enough you know I just said that air can be an insulator because it's not going to allow electrons to pass through so you have to imagine the energy it takes to literally rip through the air rip through the insulation to create a lightning strike uh, that hits the earth or hits somewhere something close to the earth okay so there, that's why they're so dangerous because you're literally ripping through the insulation um, and, and causing a, you know a giant arc flash to some degree so uh, so anyway it says voltage applied to a capacitor makes electric charge build up on each plate an electric field is created so there's a potential there so it, it still obeys Coulomb's law so the force repels the extra light charges so you know when they all gather together the force repels the extra light charges from each other and tries to attract the opposites across the gap so that's why there's a uh, you know an energy storage here because they're they're trying to pull uh, one another so I like to think about these like a charge balloon or a charge gas tank so um, you know if you think about when you blow up a balloon and just a regular balloon that first great big breath that you take and then you blow into the balloon it's really easy to release all of that air in there and so when you start to charge a capacitor the same thing it happens very very quickly it actually follows an exponential function the second breath that you put into the balloon um, still fairly easy but a little bit of resistance because now you're not just you know uh, you know pushing against a, an unfilled balloon now you've got a little bit of air pressure in there that you have to fight against to add more air and so then the third time that you blow into a balloon it's much much harder because it's almost full so there's very little room for more of them and if you try to cram them in there not only do you have to put enough effort forth to to push air in there you know in, in the small space that's left but you also now have to fight against all the air that wants to rush back out because remember there's atmospheric pressure on the outside of the balloon that wants to collapse it so um, 
So anyway, that's kind of how the capacitor works. So the more full it gets, the harder it is to cram more electrons onto the plate. So uh, when it charges, so if we have an initially uncharged capacitor, it doesn't matter what these values are, but if we have an initially uncharged capacitor, that means that it's at zero volts. So when if we put a switch in a simple RC circuit here, when that switch touches the contact at time equals zero, all of the vo voltage on the source is going to go to the resistor and none of it goes to the capacitor initially. Now over time, uh, this capacitor will start to charge up and eventually it will reach the same potential as the source, which means there's no voltage drop across the resistor, which means essentially you have an open circuit at that point. Okay, so but it takes time for those electrons to rush around and, and and charge on the plate, which is why you don't have instantaneous voltage change with capacitors like you do with resistors. If you if you double the voltage instantly, you get an in, you instantly get twice the current. Okay, so that does not happen with a capacitor. If you try to increase the voltage, it takes time for that voltage the electrons to rush around the circuit. And remember, electron flow. What actually happens is the electrons run this way in the circuit. And they come here and they accumulate on this um, bottom side of the capacitor. And eventually enough of them accumulate to where this voltage drop is 10 volts and this voltage drop is 10 volts. And that leaves nothing for the resistor. Okay. So this is what it looks like at uh, T equals infinity. You know, or T is very, very big. Right. So the voltage on the cap equals 10 volts, which means you have no current because you have zero volts across the 1K. So they are used to store, uh, store, stores charged to produce a voltage. So a lot of times you'll see these on the output of, say, a five volt, you know, TTL uh, signal or something like that. A lot of times they're used in conjunction with a Zener diode because a Zener diode produces a stable um, output as well, voltage output. So if you have them connected in parallel with each other, then you get sort of twice, you know. Uh, more bang for your buck so you know both of them are trying to work to stabilize a certain voltage output um, that can be used by another part of the circuit so you know as it's storing the charge on that bottom plate that's creating an electric field and so essentially they're storing energy there it's just it's uh, in an electric field and not an electromagnetic which is what inductors do so here's one key characteristic difference from inductors as well um, if you charge the capacitor and then you you know, like in in this uh, circuit here if you flip the switch back then the capacitor will remain charged that's why we specify here that initially this is an uncharged capacitor because if we just pick it up out of a bin and start using it it's possible that it still has a charge on it from whenever it was used last if it if it was used so you always want to discharge your capacitor before you put it into the circuit to test it so it can retain its charge uh, just like a voltage supply. Now the difference is obviously a, a you know a power supply is going to have a lot more charge stored than a capacitor will. Uh, but there are and you know there are videos online where you can search for ultra capacitors and super capacitors and see how those work and those act more like a power supply, like you would expect a power supply to work. But those are kind of you know that's not a standard board level capacitor that people are using those are those are being used for higher power you know systems so that's not what happens typically at the board level so again the reason why we say that it resists change in voltage right so a resistor doesn't resist change in voltage if you change the voltage on it it just doubles the current right or you know if you're doubling the voltage so Voltage can't change instantaneously because it requires a charge accumulation to build. So there's a time factor that we have to take into account here. It can't just, it's not just an instantaneous um, calculation. <clears throat> so it says an uncharged capacitor initially acts like a short to a sudden change in, a D, in DC voltage. So that's what I was talking about earlier with this circuit. So initially, if this is uncharged, because it takes time to accumulate, the initial value of, of the, the voltage on C is zero volts, right? So all of it is on the resistor. Now, as we go through time, it will eventually charge this, and all the voltage on the resistor will be on the capacitor. But initially, it acts like a short because um, all the resistor has all of the voltage. <clears throat> 
So it says a charged capacitor initially acts like a DC voltage supply when connected to a load R. So you could actually have circuits where um, one cycle charges the capacitor and then the next cycle it discharges the capacitor to a load. Um, now, as I said, eventually, after it has been completely charged, it acts like an open circuit when connected in series with a DC supply because, again, it charges itself to the full voltage of the source. So initially it's a short, but eventually it acts like an open circuit. And because they can retain a charge, these are very dangerous in some cases, especially if it's a higher value farad, which a farad is, we haven't talked about that yet, but the farad is the uh, unit of the capacitor and what we measure them in. So it says always discharge circuit capacitors after power has been removed and before working on circuits containing them. So some circuits, like old TVs, have caps charged to kilovolts. So, you know, that's why if you, like, if you had a, an older, older TV and your, let's say your tube went out and, you know, that's one of the things that people usually didn't get into the back of their TVs and mess with because they knew it was dangerous. Because some of those capacitors in there, um, they could either explode if you accidentally short them, you know, with a, with a um, piece of metal or whatever, uh, or they could catch on fire you know, or, uh, you know, shock you. Um, so, um, you know, sometimes, and if you go online, there's people who have different ways of dis discharging capacitors. And there are some people that are not very safe who try to use a screwdriver. In other words, they just try to short the pins together, um, you know, to have a quick burst of those electrons leaving the capacitor. So that's bad news. So you don't want to do that intentionally or accidentally. Uh, the other place that I always point out that has cap cap caps charged to kilovolts is the power supply of your PC. So I'm not talking about the laptop PC power supply. I'm talking about a, you know, like a tower that's got a robust power supply in it um, that's got a lot of different connections. Inside that cage, because uh, they usually come in a, in a, a cage-like structure to make sure that there's airflow in, internally, um, but some of those capacitors are charged to kilovolts as well. It's one of the only things that I will not try to fix in a computer. I have no problem taking them apart all the way down to the board level. If I have to replace components at the board level, I can go down that far too. Um, but I will not get inside of a PC power supply because all it takes is one false move or, or one mistake and uh, you can be in trouble. So just be careful. The other thing you have to t now worry about is, you know, like if you put a diode in a circuit backwards, it's just not going to, you know, like just a regular silicon diode, the circuit just won't turn on. And so that's not a, a problem. But if you plug in a, or if you put an electrolytic capacitor, which are the ones that are, are polarized, if you put one of those in backwards, um, or if you try to over voltage them, they can explode. And I know from personal experience that this can happen because I've done it more than once. And I haven't put them in backwards, but I have over voltaged them and pushed them a little bit too far and they do explode. On the top of the, of the uh, electrolytics, there is a little score. It almost looks like an X on the top. Uh, and so, and the reason why they do that is because if they do explode, they, you know, the manufacturer doesn't want them to explode out laterally it wants it to explode through the top so that there's less of a mess so um but you know if you do it too high then it doesn't matter and the, and the thing you know can explode no matter what so this is the equation that we use that we relate it to charge and voltage okay so we call that the farad the capacitor is measured in farads the majority of them that we use in this class are either nanofarad microfarad uh, and maybe sometimes millifarad, but millifarad is a is a very very big, almost looks like a soda can or or even bigger than a, a 12 ounce soda can, uh, pop can or coke can, wherever you're from. So so the charge, as we know from chapter one, is measured in coulombs. Voltage is measured in volts. And um, so again, farads, we you know, um, if you're using millifarad or whole farad or even you know, if you use ultra capacitors, you're using kilofarad, even though we really don't say that. We typically say like 2400 farad. Um, you know, you're working in something that's pretty substantial. If 
you are working on a, a gadget or you're working on something that works with a microcontroller, then you're using down probably in the nano and the micro. Okay, and so that's a little bit different from us using resistors because resistors we mostly use in whole, you know, we use them in whole ohms, um, kilo ohms, mega ohms, and so we use very large number of resistors, whereas capacitors, comparatively, if you're just talking about the numerical value uh, on a number line, we use very, very small number um, values. Okay, so here's the linear relationship, and uh, again, this is just a, a quick plug and chug that's easy to ask a few exam questions on or quiz questions on. So you can see here uh, the capacitor energy, and uh, as this charges over time, it says V and Q are not constant as the capacitor charges, so we must use calculus to get the formula for the energy. So it is not just CV squared, it's one half CV squared, okay? Because this is CV, if you integrate that, uh, you gotta have the, if you integrate it for V, okay, put the one half out in front and then V becomes V squared, all right? So that's where you get the one half CV squared. So you don't have to do the calculus in this course, but this equation and this equation you might see on an equation or an exam. So here's the physical characteristics again. If you wanted to get down into a, a little bit further nuanced position, you can actually determine the capacitance by the size of the plates and by the dielectric material used because there is a, uh, a chart for dielectric constants that we'll talk about here in a second that um, have different values related to a vacuum. Okay, so here we have capacitance and farads. So this is kind of like you know, when we looked at the resistors, the length and the type of material and the uh, cross-sectional area. So here, the area of each plate uh, divided by the distance between them. Okay, so this is in the denominator here. So the closer you get together, you know, the stronger the attraction is going to be and the more capacitance you're going to have. And then you multiply that, you know, uh, if you use a higher value dielectric constant, then you can you know you can get you can use the same size plate and distance and get a much higher capacitance as well just by the material that you use so that epsilon in the in the previous example here so it's expressed as actually an equation and it's whatever the relative constant is uh, in relation to the vacuum and to to a vacuum okay so this e is actually you know it's actually e sub epsilon sub zero and epsilon sub r and here is the chart so the different types of vacuum air teflon paper rubber mica, mica bake light glass it says what dielectric would give the biggest capacitance for a biggest or for a given area obviously that's going to be glass if you put that in between because uh that's a 7.5 multiplier on you know whatever size this is so obviously the you know va if you put a vacuum in between that's the smallest capacitance you know if they had the same area and the same distance obviously you're only multiplying it by one so here's some different types um, you know the different types of fixed capacitors and there are variable just like there's variable inductors variable resistors var variable capacitors um, but you can also just buy them in static values okay and so they, they could be axial like this they could have a radial lead or they could be a small disk and in your kit uh, I believe you have a mix of the electrolytic and the disks. So here's an electrolytic capacitor. So this is a what we call a chemical-based capacitor, and these are the ones that do have the polarity. Okay, and so it says it's typically labeled with a plus sign with its schematic symbol. You know that this is what we use for electrolytics, and on the actual capacitor itself. Now these say it's marking the positive. But I've also seen it where they mark the negative. And so that's typically what I have seen is, is they will mark the negative terminal. The other thing that you can look for with a capacitor to know which one is the negative is it's always the shorter of the two leads. So, you know, uh, typically when you put a capacitor in, one of the legs is bent like a knee uh, because it's longer than the other one. So you can see here initially it is uncharged. Uncharged. 
So there it goes, it's starting to charge up. You can see how it will physically start to deform once it starts reaching. Higher and higher, there's 20, there's 22, boom. And it just explodes. Now you can see it in slow motion. Just obliterated. So if you wanted to measure a capacitor, uh, there are, uh, you know, your meter may have a capacitor meter on it uh, and measure farads or you could buy a dedicated what we call an LC or an LCR meter which will measure inductance capacitance and resistance so any of your standard type of loads it will measure so an LC meter measures resistance conductance inductance and capacitance and so you know typically in the industry we call those an LCR meter so another way to test a capacitor is if you had an old analog ohm meter which most people do not but remember an analog uh, meter is just sending a signal out through here seeing how it responds with whatever is attached and then making a measurement based on that um, calculation so here it says check if a discharge capacitor's resistance goes from a short to an open okay so again it's just sending a small signal which means there's going to be a, a, an accumulation of charge here and uh, it should, if it's working properly, it should charge up to whatever um, is on here. Okay, so uh, because, you know, even though it's an ohm meter, it still has to send a signal out here with a current to, uh, to check to see what this is. Okay, and so obviously over time, there's not going to be any current flowing through here because um, it has to, uh, it, it'll become an open circuit. So this is the calculus equation that you would use uh, to describe what happens with C because uh, the current is dependent on if the voltage on the capacitor is changing. If the voltage is not changing, this term becomes zero and you don't have any current. So as long as you have an uncharged or partially charged capacitor in an active circuit, then the voltage on the capacitor is changing because it's constantly storing those electrons on the negative plate. So you, have, you do have a DVDT term. Once this goes to zero, this goes to zero. So that's just kind of an explanation of, you know, what we're looking at here when we say that this goes from a short to an open. Okay, so let's look at series and parallel capacitors. So they have to be the oddballs. Inductors and resistors add in series and parallel the same way. However, for capacitors, capacitors in series add reciprocally, reciprocally by resistors in parallel. So the same calculation that you would do for resistors in parallel, that's what you do for capacitors in series. Okay, so just an example, you know, so the total here would not be to add C1 and C2. It would be, you know, if you get rid of this, it would be uh, C total to the negative one equals the quantity one over C1 plus one over C2 to the negative one. Okay, so, um, and because they are calculated that way, when you see the voltage distribution on series capacitors, um, you should note that, you know, this looks an awful lot like when a resistor is in parallel, right, and we do the ratio for current division. So uh, the, the capacitance total over the individual capacitor, because you're always going to have a smaller total than any individual capacitor. And that rule still applies for capacitors. So for parallel capacitance, uh, super easy. Just like resistors in series, you just add them all together. So it's completely opposite of the way that you handle resistors in series in parallel. Okay. All right. Well, I think that pretty much covers the intro to capacitance. And the next video will focus on what happens during the transient period of a capacitor being charged with a resistor in series.